All right, so we're all kind of out of practice a little bit on Wednesday night, but we're going to catch up very quickly. Um, let's kind of go back through and just kind of remember what we're studying, why we're studying it. Um, John uh, tells us why he wrote the book. We've talked about that a couple of times, and it was written so that what? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and believing you may find everlasting life. Whenever we get to uh, John chapter uh, 13, and we see the Passover, the, uh, the feast of the Passover starts, Jesus knowing that His hour is now starting to come to pass, uh, would depart out of the world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And then we see a lot that starts to transpire here. Some of the things that, we, that I want to make sure that we understand also is that John didn't write just about the miracles. He wrote the miracles so that we would believe, and he chose those specific miracles so that we would believe. But the teaching that's kind of going on also does the, does, um, you know, has us to believe as well. And all those miracles did were what? They confirmed or they proved exactly what he was saying was true. And so all this evidence is out there so that the word spoken by him uh, can be proven. And what we see is um, as, as we moved on through the book, there becomes more and more people who believe. And so there's this high arc of belief. And then we start to see the Sadducees or the Pharisees and the scribes and the the religious leaders of the time, they start to step in, and at this point, we're going to start to see some waning of the of the um, of the um, belief that people start to have. Um, however, what we see in John chapter uh, 13 and then on is this discussion that Jesus starts to have with his apostles, and I want to kind of keep it in that because that's the immediate um, audience that he has. And in verse uh, in John chapter 14 and verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Uh, believe also in me. And then he tells them, there are many houses in my father's, or many mansions in my, uh, many dwelling places uh, in my father's house. And I'm going to build one for you. This is my purpose. This is why I came here. And we also, we will also see a little later on in John 16, whenever we flip over to there that Jesus says He has done the purpose that His Father has had. Now, what we see in the example that Jesus gives us in how we ought to live our lives is obedience to the Father and obedience to what He has asked us to do. Now, this is a very simple concept, but it is not easy to do sometimes. And what is it that holds us back from doing what uh, God says? Our own desires a lot of times get in the way. Fear. Fear. I mean, that's just what we read in John chapter 14. Just that inner war that we have of, you know, is it going to be worth it or not? We kind of we try to justify why we do what we do. We may have the best intentions, but we still do the wrong thing. You know, we try to justify a lot. But what we see is we don't see any of that in Christ. That's why He is the perfect example of how to follow God. And um, as we move on through, let's move on through John chapter 15 and verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, is coming. And then as we move, we're going to talk more about that in John chapter 16. And... Um, as we see him say all of this, you know, I've spoken these things to you while I'm here, but don't let your heart be troubled because the Spirit is coming. And he's going to guide you into all truth. Um, and then he says in verse 27, um, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you, do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And we said, you know, that's exactly where it kind of started in John chapter 14. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be fearful. And so he gives them this encouragement. And then he says, I am offering you peace. It is not like the peace that the world says, or the world offers. In John chapter 15, moving on down, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And then we talked a little bit about the imagery that we see here in that. 
and what he's talking about is that we are expected, specifically he's talking to his apostles here, we are expected to do what? Bear fruit. And there's only one way you can bear fruit. And that's to be part of that vine. And if you're not bearing fruit, you're going to be cut off. And um, verse uh, 12, and how do, we, how do we bear fruit? What's the, the path to get there to that? Uh, verse 10. You've got to keep the commandments that Christ has given. And then he goes on to say, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide His love. In other words, I'm the example. That's how you abide in love. That's how you uh, produce fruit. Uh, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no love than this that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And so again, he's talking to his inner circle. They understand that he loves them and he understands that they love him as well. However, Christ came to die for who? His friends? Who did he die for? I'm sorry, what? Everyone. Everyone. His enemies. And so, you know, even though this, what, he, what he's talking to them about is specific to them, about them being friends. However, what we see is that he died for all of us, even while we were yet enemies. Christ died for the ungodly. And we read that later on. And Paul, um, the, in, in Romans, can speak to a lot of degree to that with everything that he tried with the church and tried to uh, dismantle the church. All right, let's move on down and we'll go right into verse 16. And verse uh, 26, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, there's a popular mis misconception in the religious world about what a testimony is. And we see here the definition of what a biblical testimony is. And what is it? Verse 27. It's an eyewitness. It's something that you can say, I, I saw this. And that's exactly what he said. And now you're going to be, you're going to be, um, give, uh, testi uh, testify for me because you've been with me from the beginning. So all of these men have been from the beginning. Now, what does from the beginning mean? Sorry, the beginning of his work. The beginning of his work? Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say, since he's been on earth. Since he's been on earth, okay. There's a depth. Go ahead. Yeah, Acts 1 outlines when they were replacing Judas from the baptism of John to his ascension is what was needed for someone to be selected as an apostle. And so that that's what would really fit here. Right. That they've been with him through this time of his teaching and miracles and witnessed all of that. Correct. Yeah. And that's where I was going with it was Acts chapter 1 is they give that definition of what they mean from the beginning and that is from the baptism of John is the, the clear definition of from here on through. And so that's what we see here also is the same language being used. There's no reason for us to doubt that he meant anything different than what the writer Luke meant in Acts. Any questions about that? Alright, let's move on into verse 16. These things I have spoken to you so that you may keep from stumbling. So he's giving them something so that they will not stumble. When someone is in darkness, what do they do? They're stumbling around, they're trying to feel around, maybe crawling, you know, just to make sure you don't go too fast and run into something, but you're stumbling around. So what's he saying here is I'm, I'm taking you out of darkness into light. I'm showing you light so you can see what's about to happen. So you can see what's around you. So you can have clarity in your life. And then he goes on to say, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. 
Let's talk a little bit about that. So we know that Christ is called the light. And so He's offering this light to them. And He's giving them this glimpse into their future. Does the future sound bright? <laughs> no, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, some of these things are already happening. Um, if you remember, what did they want to do to the blind man whenever he presented himself in the synagogue? They want to cast him out. They wanted to cast him out, get, him, get rid of him. We also see uh, in John chapter 12 and verse 42, uh, just a few chapters back, it says, Nevertheless, many, even of the leaders, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. They did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. So that is already happening. And then what we see is that there will come a time whenever people will put you to death and they will say, what I am doing, God approves of. Was there ever a time that we can read of in the Bible where that started to happen? Paul. What? Paul. Paul? And Stephen's death. Stephen's death, very good. Jesus' death? You know, I mean, so, and he even says a little later on, I'm telling you all this so that when it happens, you'll know. I told you. All right. Um, now he gives a reason as to why these things are going to happen to them. Why they're going to be cast out of the synagogue. Why people are going to want to kill them. Why people are going to say, this is what the Father wants of us. And in verse 3, he says, these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So he's already kind of given them a hint as to I'm not going to be with you all the time. He's already told them in John chapter 15, I'm sending the helper. And now he's telling them there will be tough times ahead. He also goes on to say um, the reason that this is happening is because they do not know the Father. If they knew the Father, they would accept me. If they would accept me, they would accept you. So, as we look at this, what can we understand about ourselves and understand also, looking into the future, could this be some something that we can kind of glean from as well? I mean, some of us have been Christians for quite some time. Now, we haven't had to face the persecution of being killed that's what would be here. But, you know, have we faced some, some persecution, some hard times because of wanting to do the right thing? You could lose friends. You could, you know, be ostracized or made fun of. Right. You know, I mean, that's common, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Lose some respect, you know, maybe in your immediate family, your friends. Can't hang out with the same people. Go ahead. You know, so we can kind of understand exactly what Jesus is telling them by our own experience. And we, and just like this warning is given to uh, to these apostles and the, specifically the work that they are about to undergo, we need to make sure that people who are coming into the into the um, church and are going to say, "I'm, I'm going to follow God." you have to understand it is not an easy task. And it's not only the inside that you have to fix, but it's the outside forces as well that tries to stop you from fixing who you are. So this warning we can certainly take to heart, even though it was for the apostles because of the work that they were about to do, we can certainly understand and we can at least empathize with uh, some of this. Anything? Alright. But now I am going to Him who sent me and none of you ask me where are you going? But because I have said these things to you sorrow has filled your heart. So what 
what does he say is their understanding of what's about to happen? Do they know? Are they clueless? Pretty limited in their understanding. Yeah, they, they at least have the big picture of it. Maybe not the small details about what's about to happen and stuff like that, but they at least understand what he's saying and that he's not going to be there. Now, how that happens, they may not know, but whatever it is, is causing them sorrow in their heart. And he says in verse 7, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for I do not want for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. So some more comforting words here. Look, I have to leave so the helper comes. My job, my work, all the things that the Father has asked me is coming to an end. However, it's just now starting for you. Now, if Jesus were to stay, where would the church be? Where, you know, where does forgiveness start? Where does any of this start? So he has to go away. And now he's left it up to these uh, 12, or what is 11 men now, uh, 11 men to take on the work of God. He's been giving them the example. He's been giving them the teaching. And they're not going to be left on their own as orphans, but instead he is sending a helper and... Um, we also see that that helper is coming from the Father as well after He sends Him. In verse 8, And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So let's kind of talk about that because He kind of breaks them down a little bit here in verse 9, 10, and 11. He says, Concerning sin, because they do not believe in Me. So how does the Holy Spirit or the helper convict people of sin? Through the Word. Yeah. There is no excuse for anyone to say, I did not know. And, I mean, you know, we could talk about, you know, for many, many years, you could go to any hotel, open up the drawer, what was it sitting inside of there? There was a Bible sitting inside of there. No excuse, specifically in America. And we see that, you know, this also is, is going to be the same for them. Because when you look at everything that's been written down, just what we've read in John, and John wrote this for a very specific purpose, so that you may believe anyone who's ever read John, anyone who ever stood there about what John was writing about, anybody who ever saw anything about Christ, has ever heard anything about Christ, can be convicted of sin now. Where there is no law, there is no sin. However, we see we have to believe. And this great struggle of mankind, and that we as Christians specifically continue to have with those who refuse to believe in the Father or in the Son, they, they are without excuse. Now does that mean that every person Whoever says, I have a religious mind and I'm doing the Father's will, does that mean that they are now saved? Nope. Back up just a few verses. Because people will do things in the Father's name, it does not mean that's what the Father wants. Now what we have is a, is a Scripture that sits in your laps today. So we are without excuse. And so concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, there is enough evidence that we've already read for you to believe. We also see, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. So what will the, what will, um, the, the helper or the Spirit, how will that help us understand righteousness? Talks about Jesus, how he lived, his Talks about Jesus, his example, his teachings, everything that he did. Did you say your mind? Go ahead. And he, of course, gives a full record of his crucifixion and his resurrection, which completely justified him and proved him to be the Son of God. Correct. And you know that resurrection is so important. It is the central focus of what we 
have as Christians because this was not just a man laying down his life you know, for his country or anything like that. It was a man laying down his life and then took it back up again. Go ahead. And just to follow on with that, the, when you look at that trial, the Jews condemned him of blasphemy, which is ultimate unrighteousness. And then uh, from the Roman side of things, he's, he's just a petty um, uh, upstart who's leading a rebellion as far as official conviction, right? And when he's resurrected, it proves all that a lot. Correct. Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, just commenting back to what you were asking about the Spirit. It is the Spirit that bears witness, and the Spirit reveals all truth. Correct. And so as we talk about the Gospel, the Gospel is a revelation of truth and brings truth. And as we see throughout the book of Acts, particularly there at the beginning, it is the truth that convicts them. Correct. And you know, and this is what we know about the whole truth, is what we read is not just a book of no's. Don't do this, don't do that. What we read is a book that transforms us from the inside out. And it teaches us what righteousness is. And the reason that any of that happens or the righteousness that happens is because of verse 10 where he says in concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. He's going to the Father to be glorified, accepted, the seal of approval upon him. And the Helper, the Spirit comes back and it starts to reveal all of this. Now, in uh, John chapter 15, when he first talks about the Spirit, he says the Spirit is going to lead you into what? All truth and remembrance of all of these things. That's how John, being as old as he was, was able to write all of these things down. And so it convicts us of our sin. It teaches us what righteousness is. And then in verse 11, and concerning judgment. Because the ruler of this world has now been judged. What was it that Satan had over mankind? Yes. He had death that he reigned over. If you will, sorry, I lost my place here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Paul, if you will read that, Hebrews 2 and verse 14. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15 as well. And release those who thought fear of death were all <coughs> their lifetime subject to bondage. So, the devil has the power over death and he thinks that if I put Christ to death, what happens? At the end of that, I'll take control. Victory for me. I can hold my hands high in victory. But the very thing that he considered to be victory became his defeat. And that's why it's important about that resurrection. Because Christ overcame what should have been the victory of the devil. And so, because of that, concerning judgment, it is now ended. And that is, judgment of the world has now come. You can no longer hold people captive by death. And it even goes on to talk about there in Hebrews... Uh, and deliver all of those so he delivered all of those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery so they were stuck in their sins but yet now he has delivered that so judgment has come and the judgment is this that the devil has lost it's his defeat the very thing that he held in high regard has come to nothing and Christ has taken that from you. 
Now the decision comes on to us as we continue to read, you must obey the commandments of God, you must believe that I am He, you must um, continue to live a life that shows that as well. Because there's a reason that He's telling them that persecution is going to come. And it's not whenever that comes, you can kind of give up then. It's okay. But the persecution is about to come to Christ, and yet, instead of backing off, He hits the accelerator. And um, so, what we see here in John chapter 16 is a complete and total explanation of what the Spirit does for us, how it's working through them, and what it does for mankind. Any question or comment? Let's move on down. He says in verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now remember what he said, uh, some of these things. He said, I didn't tell you from the beginning because I was with you. And, you know, it, they just weren't ready at that time. Now they're ready to hear more. And so, what does that mean about our understanding and about our learning of the ways of God? It's a process. It is a process, and it takes time. It takes time. I mean, here these men were. They've been with Christ for what, three years now. And, yes, I don't know how long they've been with Him. Just throw that out there. But, you know, imagine sitting at His, you know, around the table with Him and Him teaching all of this. And this is only one account that we have of everything that was taught. And when you imagine that and how long it kind of takes for them to kind of get to where they are, I mean, you have John here who wrote this book and he calls himself what? The, the apostle whom Jesus loved. But yet Jesus called him the son of thunder because he wanted to bring lightning down from heaven or fire from heaven. And yet we see also with the growth that Peter has. And so we see all of these men, it takes a long time for them to become the people that God wanted them to be. But they did not give up. They were, fair, they were fairly warned, you're going to face persecution. That is no reason or cause for you to give up. And, you know, we see even, uh, even earlier, let not your heart be troubled. So as we see that, I think we should be able to see ourselves in that as well. Um, I have many more things to say to you. God doesn't just dump everything on us and now we're held accountable to everything. But what we are held accountable to is what we study and how we react to that. And are we trying to fix what the problem is? And the problem is really sin. And are we trying to weed that out and trying to do away with that out of our lives? In verse 13, but when He, that is the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. Again, very specific to the apostles. And then, how do we get this message? Through what they've written down was preserved in God's providence. Correct. If you will, please turn to 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be complete. So John tells us exactly what's happening here in John chapter 16 and verse 17. Or ch John chapter 16 and um, verse 13. 
And that is, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. It is now going to be your job to make sure that man knows this word. And John says in first John, in first John chapter one, first uh, John chapter one verses one through four, exactly what's being proclaimed. Now, other key words that we see in first John are from the beginning. We also see what we have heard, because that's exactly what. Uh, we're talking about here the words that are being spoken to them and then later on what is being revealed to them by the Holy Spirit and verse in uh, John 16 and verse 13 he says but when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you in all truth and he will not speak of his own initiative so he's going to be speaking to them so they have to be able to hear it and then we also see with our eyes so we've seen these things he also says what we have looked at what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And so all of these things made these men who Jesus is talking to very unique. Very unique in everything that John lists here. These were the only 11 men that could have followed him. We find out later as we're re replacing uh, Judas that there were others that came along and others that were being considered for this work that they had. But we see something very special in John in that he was one of those who wrote these things down so that others may believe. Any question or comment? Go ahead, Paul. Could we say uh, this is the greatest mystery in the Bible? We understand it because we know the completion. But until the day of Pentecost, these guys did They remembered every word here. The day of Pentecost. And that, that strengthened them and that made them who they were. Yeah, you know, and I don't know how that actually happens if everything's just kind of dumped all at once. I don't know if that, but what I do know is this. That whenever he says and he will guide you in what to speak, I believe that's exactly what's happening there specifically in Acts chapter 2. And all the experiences that he had had are now making sense and he's able to make those connections. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, when you read through Acts and see what the Lord spoke to them about these things, it was more of it, what they needed was revealed to them at the time it was needed. Correct. When you go before Kings, you're, you're going to know what you need to say. When John sat down to write this book, he, what he needed was what the Spirit gave him. Same with Matthew, Mark, Luke. You know, that's it, it was a process over time that it took place, not that they necessarily received it all at once. Right. right. And that, that's my understanding also, um, is that it was there when they needed it. And that's what a helper does, is he's there when you need it. All right, in verse 13, of course, he says he will disclose to you what is to come. In other words, what's in the future. Um, and then in verse 14, he will glorify me for he will take of mine and, I, and will disclose it to you. In other words, the teaching that I have, he's going to disclose it to you. Uh, and then all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. All of that truth that the Father has has been given to Christ. He's given it to the Helper. The Helper is now going to give it to you. And then in verse 16, a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. What's he alluding to? We have the benefit of flipping on here a little bit. We're talking about the resurrection here. Now, do you think they understood that was the resurrection? Do you think they believed in the resurrection? I don't believe they did until they tell it happened. Go ahead. In theory. In theory. Just like in theory. Martha and Mary. Oh, oh, I know. I know it will be resurrected. Yeah. 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 And and you know, and they were given an example through Lazarus. And yet we see whenever Christ is on that cross, do they believe he's really going to raise again? They are wholly despondent as yeah. Paul was pointing out, you see him walking on the road to Emmaus to the disciples. They they can't even comprehend what has happened, even though they've been told that the tomb is empty. Right. They, 
So they believe that they didn't believe. Right. They said they did. Hey man, I yeah. better not let go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think we all can kind of relate well, to that. Well, I haven't been there, but the greatest thrill in our life is real, the revealing of God's Word. Yeah, and you know, and the thing is, you know, as you as we pointed out, is that you know we can all kind of relate to their ignorance at some point. I mean, if we're really honest with ourselves. And we say, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but yet we do the things that we do sometimes. It really doesn't match. Our, our actions do not match our words. And, but that's what growing in the grace and knowledge of God is, is understanding that we, we have to be able to walk the walk along with the talk. And um, that's exactly what these guys have to learn. And when we moved into here and he says... A little while, you'll no longer see me. And again, a little while, you will see me. Some of the disciples said to one another, what's he saying? What's this thing that he, this doesn't make any sense. What's it, what is he telling us? A little while, you'll see me. In a little while, you won't see me. And then you'll see me again and uh, because I go to the Father. So they're still not comprehending the gravity of what's going on here. And then uh, Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, Are you deliberating together about this that I said a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Now, that wouldn't clarify anything to me until after then it would make a lot of sense. And I would say probably what we're talking about right here is probably going to be the very first thing that they think about when they find out that He has risen again. So the world's going to be very happy that I'm not going to be here. And you are going to be grieved. But it's going to be swapped. And we also see numerous texts specifically in the in the New Testament that talk about how he put because of that resurrection he put authorities in shame authorities rulers are put into shame because of it we also see what we talked about earlier in Hebrews chapter 2 he overcomes death through this um, but this isn't the only place that I think that he's kind of um, alluding to if you, uh, let's see, verse, verse 20, and I had a, my note for some of the Old Testament um, things that I saw in, uh, uh, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 13. Of course, we know Jeremiah um, is he's a prophet to which nation? Anybody know? Jeremiah is a prophet to which nation? To Judah. Because they are going to be taken captive and he's warning them. And in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 13, one of the things that he says is, Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. In other words, swapping all of those... Um, all that mourning and sadness and all of that, all of that is going to be turned into joy. And we see that later on, much later in their history, but um, because they come back from, from captivity. And so, you know, I don't know if Christ is referring straight to that. Um, there are others that talk about turning um, mourning into joy. Um, but the one that, you know, that you know, we see also that Christ talks about is in Matthew chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount, and verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So very early on, He's already teaching them this very thing that He's talking about here while they're sitting around this table um, and having this lesson from Him. He's been talking about all of this stuff before. This is nothing new to them, or it shouldn't be, 
but I do believe that this certainly is one of the things that they would have thought back to whenever they found out that he was again. Any question or comment? Let's move on. In verse 21, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. So he gives them an analogy here or a, you know, a, a simple illustration about a woman in labor. I've never had a child. I would say it's very painful because I've seen children born. And I know that, you know, the, the pain that kind of goes along with that, I cannot comprehend. This, whenever he uses this illustration, it is not the first time it is used in Scripture. It is used numerous times in the Old Testament, and it is even used in Revelation that John writes later. Um, it's used a couple of other times in the New Testament. So this is something they would have been very familiar with, with the pain of childbirth. But just as soon as that child comes into the world, the pain is gone. And that's why he's painting that illustration for them. Because what they're about to go through is going to be what? Painful. Painful. But when righteousness gives birth, joy comes. Peace comes. And you don't even think about all of that pain. So, you know, we can see why he would use that illustration uh, for them. Even though none of them can relate to that, that kind of pain, he says that's what it's going to be like. And then he goes on to say, In that day you will not question me. Um, I'm sorry, uh, back up to verse 22. Therefore you too have grief now. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. So, whatever that joy is of him being put on that cross and them having to watch that and see that, and the man that they have decided is the Christ is now hanging on a cross. And you can imagine the immense grief that they have. I mean, we read about it and we are moved. These men spending time with him, having to watch that and having to see that. But he goes on to say that once that joy comes, it will not be anything that someone's ever going to be able to take from you. And I think that we can understand that. Once we really understand who Christ is and we think about the, the painful um, nature that we kind of create in the world and the joy that kind of comes from that the joy that comes from following God, no one ever takes that away from you. It's something that's permanent. And what we see also here is that he says, and in that day you will not question me about anything. All things are going to be, you're going to understand. You're not going to question me about anything. Truly, I truly I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. And so he's talking about the exact same joy that we're talking about here. And that is seeing him hang there on that cross, him buried on the third day after he's buried, empty tomb. Imagine that immense joy. How could anyone ever be moved out of following God after that? In verse 25, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father Himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. So He tells them this whole journey about where He's going. He's telling them, all of this stuff about the Father, that um, you know, what is going to be their their new relationship with the Father, and we also see something else, and that is the Father Himself loves you.
And he says, because you have loved me. So, what credit is he given to them? Remember John 15. If a man loves me, he will keep my commandments. What is he saying about it? He says, you love me. So what does he say to them? You've kept my commandments. <clears throat> In verse 29, his disciples said, Lo, you are now speaking plainly and not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. So all of these questions of life have been answered. Everything that about the Christ has been answered. Every, all the miracles have been uh, done. All the proof is there. All the teaching is there. We know that you are the one from God. Jesus answered him, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and already has come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have now overcome the world. Now, when he says these things to them, and he asks them, do you believe now? Because of the teaching, because of everything that has gone on, they have come full circle to say, I now believe you. Now, if you remember, we talked a little bit about um, one of the disciples and how Jesus said, I saw you at the fig tree. And He says, that must be you. And He says, you're going to see far greater things than this. And so what we see here is that they have all kind of come to that place now. And it's because of the whole story that we've been reading. It's because of um, everything that John has taught us, everything that John has written down. This is why we also should be along uh, with them and saying, yes, this definitely is the Christ. He came from God. All right. And then he uh, emphasizes again in verse 33, the things I've spoke to you so that in me you may have peace. In other words, when you obey God, there is peace. In the world, there is not peace. There is chaos. There's confusion. Tribulation. Gas shortages. Everything that goes on in life that we worry about. There is none of that in God. And what we see is that you need to take courage because I have overcome all of those things. <clears throat> Any questions or comments about John 16? Okay, our time is up. Go ahead. Well, in 32, I, I always kind of got the impression there that when Jesus said, do you now believe? And then He's saying, but the hour is coming and you'll be scattered and you go to your own home and leave me alone. And he's referring to when he's taken. Oh, they, yeah, they scatter. They're terrified. Yeah. So in, in a way, he's saying, you know, be careful, you know, how you're, you know, uh, affirming your belief here because, you know, you have to, you have to realize that, you know, you're still subject to, you know, fear and stuff. Correct. And what we also, and that's why he says in verse 33, um, take courage. Because these things are going to be scary. Right. And, you know, he also has already given Peter his warning about what Peter's about to do. Go ahead. Yeah, he's, he's telling them, you're going to waver. But I know that ahead of time. And I know you're going to come around and you're going to be strong. That. That had to give them the encouragement later as, okay, he did, none of this was a shock to them. He knew what we would do. He still stuck with us right. and had confidence in us even though he knew what was going to unfold. Correct. And, you know, and I think that we ought to take that also to heart in the fact that 
he knows we're going to fail. That's how you become successful at anything, is you fail and you make the corrections necessary to set yourself up for success next time. You know, but you have to have some self-exploration and all that. But what we see uh, here, again, I think it's a good point to make, is that, do you really believe? Because this is what's gonna happen, but take courage. That's not the end of it all. All right, if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and close out.